In the course of time, modern man has taken a rather blasé attitude toward the universe of which he is so intimately a part. We look out around us upon the most extraordinary and miraculous of worlds, and yet we are scarcely astonished. Everything has gradually been deprived of its overtones. Uh, children have much of wonder in them, but as we grow older, this wonder ceases, and a kind of glibness takes its place. We do not have the answers to most of the questions that we ask, Yet we are not inclined to leave very much sentiment in ourselves toward this world and its wonders. We look upon the universe as a vast environment full of energies and elements, essences, substances. But then we have transformed the world in which we live into a kind of cosmic laboratory. The universe exists very largely to be explored and to be conquered. We imagine it going on indefinitely through the infinities of space. We have a feeling that it must have begun sometime and probably will end sometime. Or if it doesn't end, it will change continuously. Vast cosmic suns will burn out in space and new worlds will be born. And man will continue the careful analysis of spectrums and try to solve the mysteries of cosmic rays and energies around him. Actually, however, we have lost the sense of the sublime. There is probably nothing that we can ever turn our gaze upon so splendid as the sky of night. Yet to us, it is merely an interference with the routines and rhythms of the day. We simply have lost this innate romanticism that made life a wonderful experience when we felt more and did not know so much. The ancients contemplating the universe had a thrill from it all, which we can hardly understand, and which we are inclined to ridicule. To them the universe was not just space, and suns, and moons, and stars. The universe was a wonderland of living things. True, some of these things were beyond the can of mortals, we could not see them, but our forefathers knew they were there just the same, but where vision left off, intuition took over. One of the earliest realizations of man searching to understand his world and himself was the kinship between the human estate and that of nature. Man striving to understand himself explored the universe, and striving to explore the universe searched himself. There were certain parallels, certain analogies which struck him at an early time. One of the most interesting and positive concepts about this arose, of course, in India, one of the old lands where religions and philosophies and sciences were mingled together in a magnificent, magnificent extravaganza of metaphysical insight. The universe, obviously, was the body of a great being. This body had its own kind of bones muscle, flesh, and tissue. 
We can only see a certain part of that body represented by planets and stars and luminaries. But we could also be aware of the great circulations going on within this fabric. We could sense an energy field enclosing all of these separate moving parts, tying them into an extraordinary functioning entity. And that this functioning entity was ensouled, our ancestors never doubted. That it was ensouled by a power capable of administering its infinite complexity, they were also satisfied. So to them the universe was a living wonder, not something inanimate. It was not only living in the sense of being a vibratory mass of energies, it was living as having a mind and a heart. And uh, in wisdom, men sought to understand the mind of this vast structure. And in religion, they sought to understand its emotional moods. Men who go down to the sea in ships have learned to accept the ocean as a creature of moods, something more than merely a mass of water. The more we are acquainted with these various elements, the more we respect them. The more we sense something of the tremendous intelligence that is locked within them. Our forefathers also assumed the universe to be ensouled with intelligence. That every part of its plan, every part of its purpose was motivated by wisdom by some kind of knowledge, whether it was rational or instinctive or intuitive, it was still there. This knowledge, this wisdom was purposed. All things were moving toward a destiny, uh, towards an end or a goal that was known to something, or perhaps would be discovered by the very process of its own evolving uh, motion. Also our ancestors became acutely aware that nearly all physical things that we see around us, both in space and on our own planet, are actually the long shadows of laws. The universe is a vast network of regulations and rules statutes and edicts, magnificent patterns by which all procedures are regulated. The universe is not actually a place of accidents or coincidences. It is a great, well-organized instrument, moving according to the laws of its kind, fulfilling its own purposes with an exactitude that transcends imagination. And as these laws operating throughout space cast their smaller shadows upon our own planet, we perceive that this planet also is controlled and directed by a legislative power coming from nature, coming from the heavens or from space itself. Actually, therefore, bodies are crystallizations along lines of law. The processes which are immutable create their own forms. And one of the first laws that man sensed in this magnificence was the law of continual and inevitable unfoldment. Everything is growing from some previous state to some future or subsequent state. The whole procedure is as though a vast flower was opening in space. Slowly, methodically, inevitably, this blossom spreads its petals. Everything is releasing something from within itself in the process of its own growth. Thus we see that 
unfoldment of guides or guides the ways of things. And this unfoldment applies to suns and cosmic centers just as surely as it applies to the maturing and development of human life. Man is unfolding. Man is not standing still. He is not a complete creature. He must tomorrow be more than he is today. Even as today, he is more than he was yesterday. The only reason for existence is this process of perpetual growth. A man observing this growth in his own experience was not forced to be too imaginative if he recognized it also in space around him. The problem as to where law came from, of course, also intrigued our forefathers. Those systems of philosophy and religion which postulated a deity at the source of life usually assumed that these laws were an expression of the divine will. Deity could be a despot imposing its purposes upon its creation with inevitable finality. Deity could think what it willed. It could decide what it wished and by the mere fact of its own divinity could require its creation uh, to abide by its pleasures or purposes or conclusions. This satisfied some early thinkers and satisfied Western man for a great many centuries. But there were certain uh, inconsistencies in the concept. It seemed more reasonable to assume that in some way this world was not a despotism, that it was not ruled over by an arbitrary force. For if this force is truly arbitrary, then the thing that we are seeking most of all, the growth of things, would be frustrated. An absolute autocracy at the source of life would amount to predestination. It would end forever the free will of the creature. And if the creature is, sub uh, is subject to the whims of an absolute autocracy, then moral responsibility is a fallacy. How can we be expected uh, to be able to resist uh, the edicts of an arbitrary deity? And how can we expect to develop character if we are constantly forced to follow certain procedures whether we will or not? Thus, we have the problem that uh, worried Job, uh, the problem of man's freedom uh, to be himself, and in this freedom, finding the responsibility to be a better self each day. It therefore occurred to the more philosophic nations uh, that the idea of a complete fatalism ruled by an inevitable pattern of, the, of divine autocracy, with deity operating according to pleasure or displeasure and not according to value, uh, that this could not be held as a basis for an integrated universe. That it is not reasonable to assume that deity could be partial to some peoples and neglectful of others or that God could be subject to hate or whims of jealousy or could be responsible for any type of evil even though it were only the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. So it became a pattern in the ancient mind to contemplate the possibility that law preceded deity. The deity did not create laws, but administered them, much as in the case of the leader of a constitutional government, or even a constitutional monarchy. 
Nations have their bills of rights, their Magna Carta, or whatever may be held and cherished as the statement of the rights of the people. These various documents are served by governments, maintained by them, protected by them, but may not be destroyed by them. Thus the question arose, could law have come before the gods? And there are many ways in which this could be made to seem rationally possible. First of all, as we explained last week, we have to find some answer to the mystery of where the gods came from. And it might be easier to assume that they were products of law than to assume that they were spontaneous creations, something coming forth out of nothing. It might then be quite possible to assume that law, an immutable pattern, is intrinsic in the essential essences of existence, that laws like space and eternity and substance and essence and being have always existed. Therefore, that as long as the essential elements from which the world is fashioned are eternal, law can be co-eternal with these elements. For unless this is true, these elements could never change their relationships with each other and could never pass through the vast pageantries of creation which we behold when we study the stars. Therefore, the wise came to the conclusion that before gods and men there were laws. That these laws were the rules innate in all energies. That energies are self-governing. That all principles and patterns are self-maintaining. And that as surely as crystallization in rock or fission in cells. These take place with or without the consent of man or any arbitrary force that we know, simply because these processes are the right natural and inevitable procedures. Because this is true, then all existence is sustained by innate processes invariable and utterly consistent. The universe itself is a manifestation of these laws in operation just as surely as the frost picture on a window pane or the intricate geometric structure of a snowflake. These laws do not require the kind of theology with which we have been familiar. It would be rather difficult for us to imagine the anthropomorphic deity of our ancestors being much concerned with frost pictures or snow crystals. This deity seemed to be mostly involved in the miseries and misfortunes of mankind, spending part of his time saving his creation and the rest of his time wishing he'd never created it. This type of thing was not likely uh, to advance the universal procedure. But if we assume that every substance has its own rules, and that these rules have always been, and that we know the substance today merely because it does obey its own rules, and that every element that we see is truly a symbol of a process, that all compounds are symbols of the elements which create them or produce them, and every form of growth around us is simply a law bursting into expression 
through its proper means and methods. It is because of such lawfulness that man himself has been able to compile a kind of index of natural laws. The wise from the beginning have been discovering laws. But they do not seem to realize that all of these laws are but evidences of something else. The magnificent archetypal totality, which can only be attained by all of these laws in operation, and must from the beginning express through the perfection of its laws, whether its expressions are visible to us or not. If space is actually a vast area of lawful energies, then of course it follows that man's adjustment to space results from the gradual insight which he gains as to the operations of these laws. The alchemists of the Middle Ages pointed out that the Holy Scriptures were books uh, which described lawful processes, and that nature itself was also an unfolding scripture in which all of the great edicts of the infinite were set forth in living characters. This uh, attitude distinguished most ancient areas of thought. Man becoming aware dimly that he does inhabit a universe which has rules, also recognizes that for some reason he alone seems to have the power to disobey rules. Now perhaps he is wrong in this, it may be an arrogance of his own to assume that he can even be very wicked. But we do not see around us in nature as many um, rebellions against natural law as we find in man's nature. It therefore would appear to be that the most dangerous instrument of man's relationship with life is the human mind. Those creatures in which mental natures are not individualized never rebel against law, but fulfill it without question. Perhaps a few human beings who have come to a great insight into the mysteries of natural law have also verged toward this complete obedience. But for the majority, life is a resistance to this lawful pattern. The individual seemingly convinced that he is able to defend himself and his own purposes against the infinite pressures of space around him. This is one of the points which we also find in Oriental philosophy. Uh, sometimes Eastern thinkers are termed fatalistic simply because they assume that the individual is powerless to withstand universal purpose. Here in the West, however, we like to think that man is strong and universal purpose is either weak or non-existent. We have not yet learned enough by trial and error to realize where the error lies. We still assume that we have merely made some kind of a technical mistake which can be re uh, corrected in the next experiment. We are still attempting to exploit laws, to go against them, or to prove that we are superior to them, and therefore potential masters of space. Universal laws uh, have many levels of manifestation. And we can find some examples of these levels or parallels to them in the study of the spectrum. Here we observe that one light broken up prismatically provides us with a complete spectrum of colors. Yet all these colors are invisibly held within the white light. 
And if all colors are imposed upon each other, we can also achieve what we call the no color black. The problem that confronts uh, many persons is to understand, if we can, how universal law breaks up into various uh, parallel processes, each relating to a certain kind of life or manifestation. We do know, however, that as light is broken up to become colors, so the universal law pattern is broken into an ima a mass of different parallel processes. We find law applicable to harmony and sound, to light and color. We find it in the octaves of chemicals. We find it also in the various technical arts and sciences which we are developing today. We find laws in language, in, in art and painting, in perspective, and in the various uh, dimensions of dynamic proportion. We see laws in the canons of architecture. And we observe that if we break these laws, the resulting structure is not satisfactory. If we break the rules governing the processes of nature, these processes simply fail to fulfill themselves or may turn upon us and endanger uh, the individual who abuses them. If we build a house in defiance of architecture, it may fall and bury us in its rubble. Thus, everywhere, man experiences the need to discover the rules. There are laws governing even the simple trades of the carpenter and the stonemason. There are laws governing the professions, uh, the uh, methods of legislation and jurisprudence. Everywhere, Experience has taught us that we have to set up rules. In old times, one of the first great codes that was given to man, the Code of Hammurabi, was said to have been revealed to the king by the deity Nebo, or Merodach. The uh, likeness of the god was represented in the inscriptions at the beginning of the code. And in this code, Hammurabi sets forth his intuitive insight into the natural processes of human relationships. Actually, the laws of Hammurabi are still astonishingly just and extremely practical, although we have left them far behind in the complications of jurisprudence. But everywhere we have to find laws. And as we examine for them and catch up to them, or perceive them at least dimly in the abstract patterns of things, we have a new initiation into the universal plan. We become more aware that by using law constructively, all is possible that the moment we use a law constructively or give it a lawful application that has not previously been generally known, we are actually contributing to the manifestation and evolution of that law process. The more laws we discover and obey, the more discoveries that we make through the cooperation with just laws, the more rapidly the whole universe unfolds its purpose. Thus man becomes truly a kind of priest in the temple of universal law. He serves the great statutes and edicts of his faith, and in doing so also advances all lawful works in nature. These lawful works are brought out of darkness, out of caves, as Bacon said and given their proper opportunity to be known in the light, and by being known in the light to be applied to the needs of living things. In space, 
Many laws certainly exist, but again we are inclined to regard them all merely as we regard the light of the spectrum, as simply scientific facts. Certainly, life energies have to be present, but these life energies are simply uh, force or magnetism or electricity or atomic energy. We think of all these types of terms very glibly. We do not give them any clear moral value. The Egyptians and the Greeks and the Chinese, however, when they began to contemplate laws, they assumed that just as surely as a law by its own procedure established right and wrong, that somewhere in the pattern of things, this rightness and this wrongness must be regarded as moral equations. The simplest morality of the problem is that when you break the law, the law either does not operate at all or it fights back at you. Thus, to do evil is to do contrary to the proper motion of the lawful purposes of things. Uh, to do wrong is to cross law in some way. And to cross law is to suffer. And suffer is punishment. Therefore, in nature, there is set up an absolute standard of right and wrong. And it is useless to assume that nature is amoral. It is not. It is moral because in the final analysis, <coughs> morality is the use of energy. And the possibilities of use and abuse are clearly revealed in the very processes of using energy. It does not follow that you have to have a moral code of your own. It means that if you do not have such a code, your scientific process will reveal it through the very procedure you are following. And if for some reason you refuse to accept the moral implication of the experiment you are making, you will have an explosion in the laboratory or something will go wrong, has it in your own security or the success of the experiment. So that there is this good-bad factor. Good in this case being the advancement or cooperation of law. Bad being the failure of this advancement and the conflict with law. Now, the evidence is always present that in the conflict with law, man is conflicting with something so far beyond his understanding that he can, never, he can never actually win. He can never change law. But law can always change him. In this battle, then, any attitude of his own which is inconsistent with the laws governing elements, substances, processes, values, any such inconsistency must lead to misfortune of some kind. The ancients, putting all these laws together, followed much in the concept of Sir James Jeans and came to the conclusion that somewhere at the seat of life in the universe, in the cosmos, in space, was what might be termed universal intelligence. Universal intelligence does not mean a conscious universal deity. It does not mean that there is someone out there pondering upon the imponderables of existence. It does not mean that there is someone who is moving uh, the pieces of a cosmic chess game. Uh, what is really implied is a permeating universal intelligence, an intelligence that is everywhere, 
in everything and of everything. An intelligence which refuses to permit non-intelligence to be victorious in nature. An intelligence which causes all things to do that which is best and proper for themselves unless a counterintelligence exists. And this counterintelligence seems to exist in man, but it is too feeble to hazard the outcome. It is nothing, it is not possible for man to go against this larger intelligence. Science, of course, can take the attitude, and has taken the attitude, that what is termed this universal over-intelligence is simply the habit of substances and processes. That these are habitual. Yet if we study the word habitual carefully enough, we will realize that habits, like every other substance in nature, are not self-creating. A habit, in order to exist, has to be cultivated in some way. A creature or a being has to do a certain thing a number of times repetitively before the habitual process sets in. Therefore, while it may appear at this time that laws are habits of space, we cannot assume necessarily from this that the habits themselves do not arise in some form of an intellectual or intelligible process. Man's habits certainly rise in the presence of his own intelligence, and there is no conflict between the concept of habit and the concept of intelligence, nor are they interchangeable terms. We must assume, consequently, uh, that all the laws that operate in space bear witness to some kind of a legality, uh, an orderliness, and that this orderliness is essentially constructive and purposed that these laws also relating to various elements, principles, processes, and conditions are not brought into conflict with each other. And out of this vast pageantry of laws is brought the most completely harmonious instrument that we know, the cosmos. This does not mean that the cosmos never has an accident, but its rate is very low. For the most part, the cosmos is the most perfect integration of interrelated factors that we can possibly conceive. This must mean, therefore, that these laws progressing uh, and expanding through space do not come into conflict with each other. Which brings us to another important thing. How is it possible for any mass of laws tossed into the seething cauldron of creation not to end in some kind of a witch's brew? How are we to explain that all these laws never conflict? We know that in a community in which we set up a few laws for mutual protection, these laws are always unjust to somebody that the laws of a city may differ from those of a county, or of a state, or of the nation, bringing the most lamentable confusion, that the laws of various nations will permit a crime in one country and punish it in another. Also that these various laws require constant amendments due to the fact that experience proves they are inadequate. And the great legislator of today uh, is the forgotten failure of tomorrow. All of our legislations, and we are conscious beings, presumably, end in confusion. We create too many laws and cannot enforce them. Our laws, as one of the Greeks said, are like spider webs which catch small insects, but through which the greater criminal breaks and escapes. How does this 
How does it happen that this is not true in space? How can laws relating to innumerably different qualities, energies, forces, and substances all apparently work together in a splendid pageantry of cooperation? The answer was rather quickly discovered by the Greeks. The reason why universal laws never conflict is because there is only one. And all so-called divisions and specializations are merely adaptations of one principle. There is only one law manifesting one power, one quality, and one condition. But this is broken up in the processes of creation like the light upon the spectrum giving the appearance of manyness, but not coming in conflict because there is no conflict in the realities, only in the appearances. Thus all laws are complementary because their purpose is the same, and they arise within a structure which has an over power to control them all. Now this overpower, again, is not the meddling finger of some arbitrary godling. The overpower is the totality, the unity of existence itself. Law, space, substance, mind. These are all names for one thing in different manifestations. The differences lie not in these things themselves, ultimately, but in the differentiating power of the mind trying to study them. The differences lie in us, in other words, not in the objects of our attention. Our own interpretations, our own emphases, cause us, like musicians playing upon a magnificent instrument, to produce from this instrument only the melodies that we intend, even though it may be capable of performing in all uh, melodies and all harmonies. But we do realize that the reason why the universe does not collide with itself and perish in space is simply because the laws that govern it are in no conflict with each other and that conflict arises from a sense of separateness or a power of division at the root of things. And in nature, this division does not actually exist. What we call division is merely specialization within unity. This is one of the principles expounded in Pythagorean arithmetic. These laws, however, also deal with various levels and those levels which are in themselves different cannot come into collision any more than different qualities of matter or energy uh, will come into collision. Collision is almost always the meeting of similars. And that which is similar will coll collide with that with which it is similar. But the Greeks pointed out that if you fill a basin with rock, small pebbles, until it will hold no more. You can still pour into this basin a great deal of sand, because the sand going into the spaces between the stones, because it is of different size units, does not come into any conflict with the stone. After you have the basin as full of sand as you can possibly fill it, you may then pour in several quarts of water. These uh, quarts of water will be accepted and held in the basin because, again, they are different in quality from either the rock or the sand, and therefore can pass between the indices of the sand. Thus we go on with various elements. Many things can be in the same place fulfilling their own laws as long as they are themselves of different qualities. There will be no conflict between them. 
Consequently, in nature, conflict is nearly always a thing resisting its own laws, whatever they may be. And such resistance is not common to be found in space itself. Space is forever moving uh, with the magnificent sense of cooperation with things, rather than with a sense of competition. Assuming then now that we have a universe with all its laws, that we have recognized the possibility, as the ancients held, uh, that this universe was eternal, that its laws were eternal, that its substances and essences were eternal, and its objectives are eternal. We are still now concerned to some degree uh, with the relationship of the universe as consciousness to the universe as substance. Actually, substance and consciousness themselves are identical, but they represent two conditions of one eternal reality, or one eternal fact. These conditions are bridged by what the Gnosis calls emanations. Uh, the conditions of consciousness become more and more restricted resulting in a descent of value. The uh, elements of substance become more and more refined or attenuated or sublimated, causing an ascent of substance. And where consciousness descending and matter ascending finally meet, we have uh, the point of junction or the point of control wherein consciousness regains its positive relationship to matter or substance. Let's try to understand a little more on this particular theme. Consciousness, uh, as we use the term today, must exist in space or man could not be a conscious creature. The thought processes that we use must also exist, potentially at least, in every atom of space, or man could not have them. Thus we are dealing with a universe potentially conscious, potentially intelligent, and potentially endowed with all feelings, emotions, and sensory perceptions. These must be in the seed of things, even if they have not grown. Man is by no means the only product of space nor is he the noblest. Therefore, there is every reason to assume that long before his advent, other forms of life had achieved consciousness, had achieved intelligence, and had released <coughs> emotional and psychic content. This would mean, then, that there have to be powers superior to man possessing intelligence. What are these powers? Um, some of the scriptural writers, particularly St. Paul, uh, refers to the hierarchs, uh, the uh, angels, archangels, thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. These were regarded as great waves of superior life that had passed beyond our consciousness but which belong to the same vast unfoldment of which we are a part. Science would not have had much luck trying to identify the archangelic hosts, uh, but science is confronted with organisms or structures superior to man, which it has not been willing as yet to give much attention to in terms of consciousness. The most normal and immediate of these structures is a planet. Is a planet to be regarded as the production of an evolutionary process? Uh, we have our physical, astronomical uh, interpretation of how planets come into being. But we are no more talking about planets in this respect than we are talking about men 
uh, when we discuss the various developments of the fetus and the embryo. We are talking only about bodies. Science can explain bodies, but science is still having a very bad time trying to explain man as something separate from or superior to body. And many scientists have not yet made up their minds that man is separable from body. But science will admit that when the proper kind of a body is generated, something that passes for intelligence in humanity uh, is also revealed or released. Perhaps we are a little optimistic as to the measure of this intelligence, but something capable of learning to read and write is produced, even though it may never be taught to read and write. That's another problem. Science assuming, therefore, that a fortunate combination of processes produces a human body in which intelligence can develop is in the presence of other fortunate combinations of elements from which planets have been produced. Now, planets cannot hardly be regarded merely as persons in the term that we use. But we have no reason or right to assume that intelligence depends utterly upon a peculiar type of structure which we denominate the genus Homo sapiens. There could be other kinds of creatures which could have intelligence as great as our own or even greater. If the intelligence of these other creatures was identical with our own, we would be able to interpret it. We would recognize it. And seeing something that thought the same way we did, we would say, here is another magnificent example of erudition. But if this other creature had a mentation process too low for us to estimate, we could not know it. Or if it was too high and went beyond the trivia with which we make up our intellectual lives, we would have also no way of recognizing it. If planets have intelligence, it is obvious their intelligence is not the same as that of man. Also, it is quite possible that many other creatures have intelligence. And the fact that these creatures are not favorably regarded by man as being subject to intellectual advancement does not change the possibility. For mentality can exist on different levels and planes. And an, an intelligence, for example, that is completely introverted, turned entirely within, might become a very great and luminous being. But man would have no way of estimating this unless the intelligence was released or reflected in common action which man understands. That is why Burbank was of the opinion that we underestimated plants inasmuch as many of them have more sensory perceptions than man has. But their area of mentation is different. And that, to us, which is different, is usually non-existent. Let us assume, then, that the intelligence of a planet uh, is not the same as ours. That being a much vaster and more ancient organism, and far more complex in its structure, we might assume that the planet was more highly evolved than an individual and that, therefore, it might properly be appointed uh, as the throne of a deity, as it was in Greece and Egypt, and even uh, the star angels of the ancient Jews. If we want to say that a planet is more highly evolved, then all we are actually requiring to demonstrate this is a proof that the planet possesses superior intelligence. This proof is more or less uh, forthcoming at any time we look for it. 
actually each planet uh, has sustained its own uh, evolutionary procedures. On each planet, forms of life develop. The lives of these developing species may extend into countless ages. Most recent investigation indicates that man has been here as a recognized species for at least 15 million years. Therefore, the earth produces from itself. Not only does it produce forms of life from itself, but it also radiates from its own nature electrical and magnetic fields which can likewise be estimated. And certain phases of electrical and magnetic activity can be determined or noted through the aurora borealis and the aurora australis. These energy fields of the planet can only exist if the planet is alive. Nor can these energy fields be assumed to merely be an essence permeating the planet. For essences permeating the planet do not take upon themselves organized forms any more than essences permeating the human body, but in no way directly associated with it uh, could produce the specialized structure which we have in man. These essences have to be tied to a pattern, and they have to be evolving through a pattern in order to be effective or knowable or recognizable by us. I think then we must assume, and will ultimately prove to scientific satisfaction, that planets are beings, that they are, as Plato might have called them, huge animals crawling in space. Perhaps he was not as flattering as he should have been, because these are not just simply animals, they are godlings, if godlings can be seen. They represent tremendous centers of activity, mental and physical. Mental activity because the life on each planet is as methodically laid out as in space. Thus we must assume that a planet is a consciously obeying organism, that it is fulfilling law, that law is being released through it. Perhaps we would rather like to think of the planet as an unconscious obeying element or pattern, that like a flower, it is merely fulfilling its natural destiny. But we have no way of knowing that the flower does not have an intelligence. It is only that it does not uh, parallel or come within the experience of our minds. Uh, investigations in India have shown that plants can experience fear even in physical terms. Therefore, our idealist ancestors, who are not desperately trying to kill everything in space as the basis of scientific exactitude, were quite willing to assume that planets were beings, that these beings, like the human body, sustained an infinite diversity of life, permeating them and, of, and upon their surface, that these forms of life are all provided for by energies released from the earth, and that this balance of energy is maintained uh, by bringing the living things upon a planet into a harmonious balance between earth energy and solar energy. That in the uh, development of creatures, therefore, the great mother earth was a a fertile area for production. And from this fertility, the seeds in the consciousness of the earth principle were released. And as the earth entity came into embodiment in the planet, 
it released also into embodiment all the seminal lives which it carried with it from previous embodiment. If the earth can be regarded as some kind of an intelligent organism, then we can see how earth processes, when allowed to fulfill themselves in an orderly manner, may be regarded as adequate. That just as surely as man disobeys the rules of nature, which in this case would be the earth planet uh, factor, he becomes confused and sick. That the earth, therefore, has its own way of revealing or administering the laws which are part of the universe itself. Planets, in a way, are embryo suns. Other forms are developing in space which will gradually become great centers of solar power. And the suns, in turn, must be regarded as intelligent or uh, intellectually uh, moved or dominated in some way. The planet is a center for the dissemination of intelligence. The sun is a greater center for the dissemination of intelligence. All of the great central focal points, even beyond the vast categories of constellations and the Milky Way, are immense areas for the release of intellectual or intelligible power. The Greeks preferred to think of the solar power as intelligible. Actually, this intellect, this mind, this thought consciousness power is inherent within the radiance of suns. And the, this radiance, in turn, permeating planets, is reinterpreted through the planet as the wisdom of the elder is reinterpreted in the education of the child. Therefore, planets are children to the parent son, which acts not only as parent but as teacher, continually radiating energy with indwelling intelligence, by means of which energy, by the way, uh, naturally resists the misuse of itself. While it is not always able to prevent abuse, energy itself fights against abuse, providing every possible means of right usage and immediately punishing abuse uh, with some form of a disaster. The next point that we have to bear in mind, perhaps, is that from all these various centers of consciousness, light, life, power, force, energy are moving. And that these are all interchangeable terms signifying the same principle in different levels of manifestation. Therefore, in every level of mani manifestation, Intellect is present, but specialized in different ways. In every level of manifestation, consciousness is present, but is differentiated variously. In those forms of life which are not yet capable of maintaining uh, an organized consciousness, we find this conscious principle working apparently upon and through form by means of instinct. Uh, various minute microorganisms fulfill the laws of their being, although we can find no evidence in them of any central nervous system or any mental structure. We know, for example, that creatures without any vestige of a brain, so far as we can discover, are capable of at least rudimentary mentation that these creatures that have no brain 
no way, as far as we can tell, of knowing anything, no sensory perceptions by our standard can still become aware of food and will draw themselves or move themselves relentlessly towards this supply and will in many instances uh, show extraordinary skill in the capturing of the necessities of life. Thus that which has not any eyes can apparently be aware of food, and that which has no mind can scheme a way to get it. We have to have only one answer to this, that the mind and these sensory perceptions are there, but on a different level from ours. And if the level is different, there is no need for the clumsy process of building brain the way that we do. This is a peculiar process necessary to our own species, but in no manner demonstrating the ultimate of the intellectual release. Laws also follow in the line of consciousness, and through planets and suns, laws are released by light itself. This perhaps is the uh, explanation of the great Buddhist deity, uh, the uh, Virokana Buddha. This, or Dainichi Nyori, is the great cosmic abstraction. It is the ultimate conceivable form of a rational being, beyond which we can imagine only the darkness of unconditioned space. Dainichi is the last conceivable shadow, the immensity which, at, uh, which cannot be further increased without becoming unintelligible. This great cosmic power is the supporter and sustainer of all things through itself. And uh, the manifestations of every conceivable level of existence uh, are sustained by the energy, the great sun or solar energy, the cosmic solar energy of Dainichi Niori. The being, obviously, is hypothetical, symbolical, metaphysical. But the principle for which it stands has strong scientific possibilities. For it simply means that somewhere in the infinitudes of space, is the master pattern from which universal and cosmic systems evolve within each in its turn lesser systems until we proceed downward from the greatest imaginable cosmic organism to the least conceivable cosmic organism only hypothetically uh, knowable even in the presence of the most powerful electronic microscope. We have then the infinitely great and the infinitely small bound together, all being expression of one process. This one process having as its root and substance cosmic consciousness. Just how we shall define this cosmic consciousness is also a little troublesome. A number of years ago, we had quite of an, an epidemic of it among metaphysicians. Uh, nearly all anyone could have cosmic consciousness in three easy lessons. There uh, seems to have been a little shortage of the uh, complete result, but everyone was hopeful. Actually, cosmic consciousness is something that we cannot rationally conceive. If we can to achieve to it at all, it can only by, be by a direct experience of consciousness, which might be termed a mystical experience. But this mystical experience available to man could only be one of the lesser reflections of the great pattern itself. Cosmic consciousness cannot be directly experienced. It can only be symbolically experienced through the contemplation of the cosmos. 
In other words, if there is anywhere a form capable of bringing the cosmic consciousness within the conception of man, that form is the cosmos. This is the great mandala. This is the universal symbol by which man may sense but not understand uh, the measure of the universal consciousness itself. Man may recognize aspects of it, but he cannot possibly experience the totality of that experience which projects worlds into existence. Science is divided, philosophy has been divided at times, as to the nature of this consciousness. Some skeptics have said, are we simply fooling ourselves? Is this so-called cosmic consciousness merely a term that we have invented to explain a mechanism that we cannot understand. Uh, the question to them, of course, is, does the universe require this basic consciousness? Does it require anything except a perpetual motion machine, an instrumentality which can propagate itself forever without any need for a sovereign intellect? This is a persuasive argument inasmuch as it also makes further thinking on the subject unnecessary, and very few people want to think if they can possibly avoid it. But actually it does not solve very much. Cosmic consciousness is a necessity for one reason only, that man is conscious. If there is not some kind of consciousness, superior to man, where did his come from? And this offers no uh, solution to the scientific riddle. If the scientist wishes to say that consciousness in man is simply the product of the evolution process in which he is gradually building instruments capable of producing consciousness, which does not exist until the instrument is available. Then the scientist must settle down to try to figure out how many more conscious uh, manifestations have preceded man, and consequently how much superior material is available for the production of consciousness than is uh, found in the constitution of man. If evolution has been forever, in other words, Consciousness must have arisen before man, or it could not have arisen in man. Just as surely as it must arise in man, if it is to arise later in some other form of life. So consciousness being something we possess, puts us in the same dilemma as the architect who stood looking at the Pyramid of Giza. He shook his head sadly and said, if I hadn't seen it, I would deny its existence. It's just not possible. But having seen it, the architect was on the horns of a dilemma. He could not deny it. This is much the developing position of science. It is no longer possible to categorically deny consciousness unless we wish to affirm that we have a consciousness ourselves capable of denying it in something else, and to assume that we are the only creature in the infinitudes of time which have produced the endless pageantry of the cosmos, that man and man alone has reached the degree by which he can be aware of his own existence. Uh, this, is, this is a little too arrogant even for the average scientist to contemplate. He is forced to reorganize his thinking. But if we will assume for a moment that this consciousness in things arises from a consciousness in all things, then we can also realize 
that from this consciousness arose what Pythagoras called the law of mathematical sequences. In other words, a consciousness is necessary to produce patterns which can only be evaluated in terms of consciousness. If a pattern is obviously the production of consciousness, can only be discovered by the extension or education of consciousness, then we are dealing with a factor uh, which is difficult uh, to depreciate. We are confronted with the simple inevitable that consciousness itself must be at the root of all these conscious processes, processes which have within themselves a, a sense of a live value, mathematics, for example, uh, which with all its phases and all its departments must be regarded as something so profoundly intricate that it could only have been produced by an intellect superior to itself. Man has not even begun to explore the profundities of mathematics. And we cannot say that, uh, say that geometry has evolved by merely tossing together a series of unrelated accidents. Mathematics alone demonstrates the absolute order of existence. And mathematical procedures and processes and instruments used as we have used them in atomic research to carry on beyond the power of the human mind so that we have to depend entirely upon formulas which operate although they cannot be interpreted in terms of human experience. We have to assume that man in the next hundred years or the next five hundred years will penetrate still further into the mystery of mathematics. To do this he must use his conscious faculties. And he can gain his own knowledge only by the increase of these faculties. We, only, we must come to the conclusion then that any problem which consciousness alone can solve and which solved proves to be an absolutely orderly procedure, that such a process can come into existence itself only by consciousness. There is no other way in which it can uh, come into existence. So we are using consciousness, in a sense, our own consciousness, as a net to capture universal consciousness. If we could capture universal consciousness with plain stubbornness, we would use that. If we could convince ourselves beyond all doubt that there were no universal processes, we would also follow that as a line of least resistance. If we could conquer universal procedure with our appetites, our emotions, or our sensations, we would use those. But we cannot. The only way that we can investigate the universe around us is through the use of the highest faculty that we possess, the conscious mind. The answer has to be that the thing which we are investigating was the production of a mind no less than that which is required to discover it on our part. So cosmic consciousness is more or less justified uh, irrationally by the evidence which arises from its own existence. In mysticism, man himself has always sought to some way penetrate the purposes of deity. He has always desired to know the will of God. Religions have been created on the basis that they were revelations to sages, saints, patriarchs, prophets, by which the will of deity was made known. 
Nearly all of these so-called religious revelations have been moral systems. Moral systems being based upon the great primary experience of living things. <clears throat> the experience of the consequences of coming into conflict with natural law. Thus what these religions actually tell us is the rule of the game by which we have to live. The reason for the rule it cannot give us. And where the rule originated, it can only arbitrarily declare that these rules originated in the mind of God. Actually, uh, cosmic consciousness, as sensed in India, particularly in the yogic schools, uh, was not merely a central consciousness, not merely uh, the mind of a being somewhere in space. Uh, cosmic consciousness was an enveloping immediate value. Cosmic consciousness is in every atom. The true and full consciousness of the universal purpose is closer to us, to us than ourselves at all times. The only difficulty is that we are unable to tune into it or to adjust our own finite faculties uh, as we might adjust an aerial on a television to pick up certain stations. What we are trying to do is tune in cosmic consciousness. But when we attempt this, we always seem to tune in something else. Actually, we are tuning in merely conditions of it. But the full and total experience of it is beyond us because we lack the faculties with which to estimate that which is utterly transcendent. In the uh, Buddhist philosophy, of course, we have the same essential problem. Uh, for cosmic consciousness, in this case, is substituted uh, the principle, consciousness, or energy of the Virakana Buddha. All things live by virtue of this cosmic power in, in perpetual meditation. Functioning from uh, the Dharma Rupa, or body of the law, this consciousness of the Virakana Buddha remains forever in the contemplation of the infinite purpose, remaining, so to say, eternally introverted, in a state of absorption in nirvana or samadhi, universal consciousness knowing. Uh, the uh, idea in this system, of course, the esoteric Buddhism, uh, of the Shingon and the Tantra is that the individual, the human being, seeking to achieve cosmic consciousness by some methodology, comes the nearest to it by the realization that pure consciousness is that which is separate from and entirely different from any type of consciousness that we know. Pure consciousness, then, then, must be experienced only when all conditioned consciousness is suspended. Those persons attempting to suspend conditioned consciousness either go to sleep or become obsessed by the psyche in their own subconscious. When the individual doesn't try to be anything, he is unfortunately only himself, and this does not serve the purpose. When the individual does not try to be good, he simply succeeds in not being good, that's all. Nothing is clarified, because the individual's subconscious upon which he must depend for quietude is too toxic to permit quietude to arise. All he gets is negation, not quietude. Theoretically, however, if the individual 
is able to actually escape from all the conditions which personal consciousness impose upon him, he can achieve pure insight. And this pure insight is the nearest that can come to man of the consciousness of the meditating uh, Dainichi Maori. It is the highest type of samadhi. It is the achievement of the experience of the all-conscious apart from all-conditioned consciousness. But of course, most of all, it is this unconditioned ever capable of being conditioned by the rising of the will within the meditating deity. In other words, this deity, Dainichi, can at any time cause any kind of consciousness to arise, because total consciousness can release from itself according to will and yoga, that which is required. The individual, however, has no such immediate capacity, but he is capable of sensing a kind of all consciousness that is not particularly conscious of one thing. The uh, mystic in his illuminations and in his uh, visions and in his ecstasies usually experiences universal consciousness merely as a tremendous internal exhilaration. It is sudden release. It is the, the emergence of the individual from some dark and heavy region into an airy and wonderful realm of light and peace and beauty and happiness. In this experience, the mystic has the inward sense of all-knowing. But this sense is expressed only in uh, the experience of God loving. It would seem to the being in the mystical experience that he could play a piano or a violin if he had never touched the instruments before. He would have the power to play them within himself. But if he wanted to play the physical instruments, he would have to learn as the same way anyone else would have to learn. Cosmic consciousness does not skill the body. Rather, it becomes an ornament and a vital moving force for the body which has already skilled itself. There is no substitute uh, for the struggle uh, to gain mastery of body, emotion, and thought. But in this experience of cosmic consciousness, the individual has the sense, a strange, perhaps impossible, over-recognition of the unities of life, of the tremendous realities of things, antagonism, separate, separatenesses of all kinds, fade away. There remains only the sense of the profound uh, accord between all of the parts of life, uh, the experience of being one with the universal consciousness itself. And this universal experience is as though consciousness was a great sea or ocean permeating all things. And in Buddhism, the individual attains this uh, in the mantra as the dewdrop falls back into the shining sea. The individual becomes one again with the eternal. Uh, this type of consciousness, if man can even sense it, suddenly unfolds for him the entire pattern of the universe. He realizes that the essential universe is consciousness, that all of the appearances and forms that we see are merely, as Plotinus calls them, the effulgent blossoms suspended from the divine nature, that everything actually is a mystery in consciousness forever moving. Uh, towards the destinies which lie hidden within its own depths. 
Man sensing something of this then is able to understand at least in a measure how all laws, all principles, all processes can be within consciousness. That just as surely as every physical substance necessary for the creation of worlds must be in what we are likely to call empty space, so every spiritual need must be uh, met and sustained and supported from the more abstract spiritual kind of vacuum uh, which uh, materialists assume to be all that extends beyond matter. We have to assume, therefore, that this invisible, intangible thing, which we call spirit or consciousness, is absolutely uh, the source of all tangible, manifested existences that in it is not only consciousness, but the root of all substances, that just as surely as this vast sea of consciousness extends invisibly, within the bottom somewhere hidden in this sea are rocks and mountains and stones. Everything that exists has to come into manifestation from this thing which seems to be empty. Also, from this same process, must flow out all of the laws which are like the currents of an ocean. Currents by means of which uh, all of the processes of creation are carried out. The wise men follow the currents and are carried by these currents in their little ships to safe harbors. Those who try too hard to steer themselves in unknown seas often end on the rocks. But whatever be the procedure or analogy we wish to use, we have to sense that all the laws likewise emerge from these basic processes. Now, one more law that we can perhaps give a thought to at this time is the great law of evolutionary process. Evolution is the impulse behind uh, the ideation or release of the potentials of processes of growth. Evolution, therefore, uh, actually is a motion of a thing toward its ultimate, toward that which is forever next. And in this case, the next must always be better than that which precedes it. Evolution is then the unfolding of life. But evolution is also the reuniting of consciousness. Just as surely as growth seems to unfold the beauty of the individual part as several flowers magnificently evolving their blossoms, so growth likewise is the process of bringing the consciousness of these forms back into a state of unity. Therefore, all evolution is toward unity. All evolution is to, toward the rescuing of existences from the illusion of separateness, resulting from inadequate uh, power of inward discernment or discrimination. Evolution is the release and improvements of those faculties by which the identity of life can be comprehended. The instruments by means of which evolution is advanced are the two doctrines of rebirth and karma. Uh, rebirth applies not only to man, but to planets, to suns, to every type of life. Because rebirth is simply a, a law of cyclic process. All forms uh, due to the fact that they are artificial compounds. They are space itself or consciousness itself curdled into a temporary organism. Uh, this temporary organism is not the true and proper owner of this space from which it fashions an instrument. 
Therefore, it must come to this instrument and depart from it. During the process of investment with this instrument, the consciousness gains manifestation on some level of manifestation. Having achieved a certain measure of manifestation, it must retire again and build a new instrument. Thus the doctrine of rebirth applies to suns and cosmic suns and universal systems. For all of these have to ultimately be dissolved and then reintegrated on a higher level. There is an operation working in this also which we do not fully understand but which we see a parallel for in human life, namely that long living and much experience not only creates an exhaustion of powers but also results in a confusion in the ability to digest experience. Consequently, a period of mental or emotional rest must also be set up. Otherwise, the person uh, is unable to escape from the crystallization of his own faculties. And in some way, the crystallizations in space produce also this degree in which they imprison or frustrate life. Therefore, the forms must be dissolved and rebuilt. Karma applies likewise to all creatures possessing initiative. Karma is still the guardian and leader of every power or condition which decides or arrives at any conclusion about anything. The deity, if it wills to create, must accept the consequence of creation which is usually to be absorbed into the creation and die there, at least temporarily, to be res resurrected later through the evolution of the creation itself. But wherever there is action arising from determination or from consciousness, there has to be a tendent reaction. This is why in the Buddhist philosophy, Nirvana is actually the suspension of the impulse of action. Nirvana is the continuing of a causeless state which cannot therefore produce any consequence. In this way, there is a complete suspension of the processes which either build up or tear down by cosmic procedure. Karma is both good or an adverse. The greater the degree of consciousness, uh, the greater the virtue of karma. Therefore, the concept of heaven, which is actually the karmic consciousness of a deity which cannot create evil. This is uh, the old philosophical clue. Whereas hell in philosophy is always uh, the creation of a consciousness capable of evil. And consequently, uh, the infinite creates the heavens, and men create their own hells. In uh, karma, this procedure, therefore, follows along and sustains the procedures of existence. All of these move about the principle of equilibrium, which is also established as a pattern in space. For equilibrium is the condition of the pure principle of space itself, uh, within which polarization arises, but the space itself is never unbalanced. Equilibrium, therefore, is the symbol, actually, of eternity. It is the symbol of that which unborn cannot die, unfashioned cannot be destroyed. Uh, having no beginning can have no end. And having achieved complete equilibrium within consciousness can never again be embodied in an unbalanced organism. These processes all exist and these principles all reside in space, together with many more of which we are now unaware. 
and it would seem that sometime along the way of life, great thinkers and great leaders of knowledge should be exploring the mysteries of the cosmos for the discovery of these great values, these great principles, so that someday we can build upon them a science of human regeneration based upon man's restoring his true insight into his own relationships with the cosmos. If this can be attained, man attains uh, the greatest degree of security that it is possible for him to know. Well, I guess our time is up for this evening, folks, so we hope to see you next week. Thank you.